Hello, hello, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Business Brunch. We are your working from home team. Uh, we are here to help you connect, learn and thrive. And you may have noticed we have a special guest with us this week. So this week with us, we have Marianne Seagard. Marianne is a broadcaster, a well-respected journalist, a hugely sought-after speaker, and she is oh, the visiting professor also at King's College London. And she is the author of best-selling The Authority Gap, and we are absolutely delighted to have you with us. So welcome to the show, Marianne. Thanks very much for having You're me welcome. on. Looking forward to it. Good, good, good. Thank you. So also with us, we have Melinda, who is... Uh, well, you've changed jobs recently, but you are <laughs> you were a consultant in, in business change and, and strategy. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you want to say anything more about that now with your new title? Uh, well, basically, uh, I'm still an expert in consulting, uh, but I'm formalizing that uh, <laughs> in the moment uh, with the role as director of managed services for a company called Helm 360, who provides services to global law firms and accountancies and consulting firms. Excellent, excellent. And of course, we have Sarah Farmer with us, who is an executive coach and founder of EMR Consulting. And that is me. And that is you. And you're wrangling the comments today, aren't you, Sarah? I am. I'm comment. I'm chief comment wrangler. I've been, I've been promoted. I'm surprised you promoted me after my mess up last week. Um, <laughs> You, you can't here. control the internet. That's the challenge. Technology is not always our friend. I've got to let you into a secret. Might have actually forgotten to plug something in. Oh. I know. Had the room decorated, new pic oh, new picture put up, and didn't quite put everything back in place. So um, I'd like to say I was slightly stupid. But anyway, I'm here now, and I'm so looking forward to listening to Marianne. So um, we've got a few people that have come in. Danny's in already. Welcome, Danny. Thank you for coming back. It's lovely to know you're there. And Stephen, Stephen Hayden as well. Hello, ladies. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Stephen. And uh, here's the lovely Danny as well. So oh, if you are around, then say hello. Let us know you are here and where you're um, dialing in from as well. It'll be interesting to see where people are in the world. And just a reminder for those who are new to the program or maybe uh, haven't been here at the very beginning before, uh, you may see comments come up on the screen that are not in your feed. And that's because we, are, we have many feeds coming into one place. So you will only see the comments that are for the feed that you are in um, until we bring them up on the screen. So it doesn't mean that you're alone mm -hmm. if there happens to only be a couple of you on your current screen. Um, and also there's a lot of people who like to hang out in the background, but please jump in, join us and uh, type into the, into the chat, into the comments, and we will see what you have to say. Uh, so any Gary's, you Gary's in, Gary, Gary Spencer's in. Hi, Gary. We've also got Kemi, um, Kemi or Kimi. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but nice to have you on board. We have uh, Waggy um, who has joined us again today. Thanks for coming back and joining us. It's lovely to see our regulars coming in. Uh, it just, it's really mm -hmm. nice to know that you keep it. Means we must be doing something right. Um, and we've also got Anna, uh, Anna, Anna Van Roon, lovely name from Cambridge. We have Yvonne Winter as well, calling in from Gloucester. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we have, oh, what's happened there? Let's get that one up as well. We have Elisa. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your surname because I'm going to get it wrong. But you're in London. So lovely uh, to see you all. And thank you for joining us. And I'll let you know as and when more people pop in. And we've Thanks. got... Uh, this is a great time if you'd like to share this session with any of your contacts before we get started with Marianne uh, to bring in any contacts that you think might get a, a whole lot of value out of this session. Can I just say, sorry, hello to Professor Kate Black, but also Danny's just made me laugh. He said, you stop sharing great content and we'll stop turning up each week. Deal? Yeah, <laughs> deal. I like it. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, we've got Chris Lomas as well, who's joined us. Hello, Chris. Thank you for joining us. Uh, looking forward to hearing your comments and your contributions today as we talk to Marianne. And Taylor's in as well. Oh, first time. Welcome, Taylor. Uh, popped up on LinkedIn, so look forward to hearing from you all. Brilliant. Well, we're very glad to have you on board. We will do our best to amaze you. Um, and uh, you will. Yeah. 
can I just say actually a special welcome to Chris Lomas? So I don't know if you know Chris. He works or he leads a charity called Hope Four. He started off helping people in Moldova. He moved to Moldova to help the Moldovans. It's the poorest country in Europe. And then, of course, what's happened is with the war in Ukraine, they're getting thousands of um, refugees into Moldova. So the poorest people in Europe are helping these people. And Chris is is making it all work. So I applaud you and your work. Um, and if you don't follow him, do follow him on LinkedIn. Find out about this amazing charity and the support that they're giving to the Ukrainians and the Moldovans. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Chris, from your very, very busy life, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, we've got a, an unnamed LinkedIn user, might be Joanne, don't know. Um, she said, somebody shared the link and said, hello, um, we're very grateful to have you, whoever you are. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, remember, this is all about networking as well. So if you're open to networking, could you just put an, a, a, a note into the comments saying, yeah, open to networking, um, share your LinkedIn profile if you want people to connect with you. And obviously, the more people we know, the better. So this is the whole purpose of this session. It's not just to learn stuff, but it's also to connect with like-minded people. So let us know if you're happy to connect. Absolutely, absolutely. So normally, and we'll just do this very quickly because this is a topic that I really want to talk about. I normally, to how was our weekends? And obviously, we had the last week off because it was the bank holiday. So very quickly, Marianne, have you had a lovely weekend? Have you done anything nice, anything special? Oh. I just had the most beautiful weekend because it was the most perfect spring weather and mm. I was in the countryside and everything is just bursting into life and the blossom's still there and the mm. birds are singing their heart out and we went for some lovely walks and a pub lunch. Couldn't be nicer. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah perfect. And you're right, the blossom at the minute, it's just still there at the end, isn't it? Yeah. And my front garden looks like it's snowed because the blossom's going to come off oh, the tree. I love that. It's just beautiful, absolutely. How about you, Melinda? Have you had a nice weekend? Uh, yeah, it was largely doing preparation. I've got a good friend of mine from Ukraine with her, her baby and her mum have made it out of Kiev and oh. they are coming they're they're at a mutual friend's house uh now near london and they're coming to mine on wednesday oh, so brilliant so getting ready for that and um get doing some you know searching and pre uh proactive searching to find them a flat in the area around me which is where they want to settle for now so it's just been really busy but quite positive in that regard excellent how about you sarah um, I'm just uh, just popping these things. Thanks for everyone that's popping in, saying they're happy to network as well. Uh, mine's going to lead rather nicely into this conversation. I have had my mother here this weekend, and I all I've heard this weekend is how lucky I am to have a husband who cooks. <laughs> how lucky I am to have a husband who does X, Y, and Z. It has driven me up the blinking wall. She won't watch this, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> It's driven me mad. Why am I lucky? Because, <laughs> because he works so hard. Hold on. I work longer hours than he does right now. Don't intend to forever. I am not lucky. This is a partnership. And with that in mind, help me out, help me out Marianne, because I did feel like I was going to lose the plot slightly this weekend. <laughs> so, I think one of the things I beg is for, is for men to do an equal share of the unpaid work, because that really holds us back and yeah. in fact I, I dedicated the book to my husband Di and I call him the unlikely feminist <laughs> because way back in the 80s when we first met he was up for doing everything absolutely equally and he has you know he's done that all the way through we've raised the children equally as a team and it was very unusual in those days so I, I am grateful actually yeah, I, I, I'm not feeling so grateful. Um, <laughs> just, I just feel, it, why not? It's you know, just because I'm female and he's male, it doesn't it, it doesn't make any sense to me. But what's interesting is the old mindset of the previous generation is, wow, this never happened to us. So we can see where it comes from. But yeah, I, I mean, over to over to Vanessa, who's got a barrage of questions for you <laughs> about this topic. But I think the first one then is when we are meeting things like this is, is to ask you what inspired you to write the book. OK, well, it's called The Authority Gap, which you've said. But the subtitle is why we still take women less seriously than men and what we can do about it. 
And so that's what it's about. And I suppose what's inspired me is an entire lifetime of noticing women being taken less seriously than men, mm. being underestimated, patronized, interrupted and talked over, uh, people being resistant to being influenced by them, having their expertise challenged, uh, having their authority resisted, you know, and I've just noticed that we are still, even in 2022, more reluctant to accord authority to women than to men. And it's bugged me all my life. And so mm -hmm. I thought, well, I better just write a book about it and try and assemble all the evidence that proves this to be the case and then work um, out, you know, what we can do to narrow that gap. No, thank you. I mean, that was one of the things when reading it, because, yeah, I've, I've kind of I've been a senior manager for probably 20 years but in meetings, quite often, I would put forward an idea and it would nothing would happen. And then the conversation would carry on. And then somebody else, male, would then put forward that same idea. And then everyone was like, oh, that's a great idea. And start talking about it. And I read your book and found that actually it's happening to women all around the world. It's a new thing. You know, what happens is this is such a common phenomenon. And we tend to beat ourselves up about it individually when that happens. And we think, oh, maybe I wasn't confident enough or I wasn't articulate or eloquent enough. Mm -hmm. No, you were just too female. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, a, there's a fantastic academic study which proves this point. And I think, you know, it should actually cheer us up, at least to understand that it's nothing personal in our own behavior. It's yeah. the way the system works and the way that people perceive us. So what these researchers did was they set up actually a mixed sex group of people ostensibly to decide a child custody case and they deliberately chose that subject matter because it's actually quite female stereotyped mm -hmm. and they gave the group all sorts of information about the family concerned but they gave a couple of members a piece of information that the rest of the group didn't have and when that information was introduced by a man it was six times more likely to be used by the rest of the group in their deliberations than when it was introduced by a woman wow. six times more likely that's how much harder it is for a woman to influence a group, even if the group has women as well as men in it. Mm. And I'm assuming, sorry, that that's, I, I'm very interested in how studies are done with pharmaceutical background, but this, so I'm assuming that the, the male and female voice had the same intent and the same clarity. They weren't, the message didn't change. It was purely the male versus female voice difference. Well, it's very hard to correct for that, obviously, but they but they did it, you know, they repeated it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, um, that's incredible. And, yeah. and there was that similar uh, experiment, well, it was an accidental experiment, but I read about it maybe two years ago, where um, a woman who was in kind of an upper management position was going to be out of the office for the day. So she asked her colleague, who happened to be male, to keep an eye on her inbox and she gave you know for rights to it and so he was replying from her inbox and he was like he couldn't believe at how people were not taking what was said seriously even if the same exact words were yeah. coming from her email address versus his email address even though at the end he was signing it saying it was him but it's just people weren't reading that far to realize yeah. that it wasn't the female entity who was actually replying. And this guy, and unfortunately, I don't remember the, the name details. I've, I've got it in the book, actually. Oh, okay. so, yeah, so he, he, he did it for a day and was really shocked because she had always complained about how difficult these clients were to deal with. Mm -hmm. And her manager was blaming her for being too slow. And she said, no, they're being really difficult with me. And so this happened by mistake, as you say. Yeah. And so they decided as an experiment to swap email signatures for two whole weeks just to see. And sure enough, he found it incredibly frustrating and belittling and irritating and hard work. And she said, oh, this is just amazing. <laughs> These have been the two best weeks of my working life, you know, signing okay. up as a man. That's incredible. <clears throat> Can I just bring up some of the comments that are coming? Well, quite a few just to, just to catch up. Mm. Um, uh, Robert says gender equality begins at home. It didn't begin in my home this weekend, but never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, Leon, or it says when your mum's not there, and that's what's important. Yeah, true, true. Uh, from Dubai, open to networking, and we have uh, Robert saying excited to hear Marianne today. Just finished reading her amazing book. Fabulous. Ooh, um, and it's important to say, isn't it? I think that you know we, we're talking about this as, as if it's. It's all men that do it all the time. And actually, most men 
consciously would choose not to and I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on that because there's a an unconscious bias towards it mm. and also probably a culture thing as well maybe mm. there are industries where it's more prevalent than others but um mark says definitely an old mindset my father-in-law can't cook doesn't do washing doesn't do anything that is, dis that is dis uh, domestic he should live with my mother when he watches my one-year-old he won't change nappies and has to wait for my mother-in-law oh it's just terrible um what else have we got? Uh, Rachel's open to networking, so I have to hear all this lunchtime. Waggy is saying, it is a culture issue. I do respect women's rights. Yeah, and we're not saying all men don't at all. This isn't about a man bashing session. Might end up as one, but it's not meant to be. Um, yeah, and when they become mums, a future build-up of culture needs to them to carry on this mission, okay? And unfortunately, I had to leave at one. Uh, I have a question for Marianne. Firstly, I loved your book and the work you do. I'm wondering what can be done for companies to start sharing their gender pay gap report and take action. Do you want to answer that now? Yes. Well, um, just to say there is evidence that uh, actually measuring your gender pay gap helps to narrow it. Mm -hmm. Or at least, I mean, I think it, it, it gives you the motivation to narrow it. So companies that do gender pay gap reports do tend to achieve progress in narrowing the gender pay gap. So it's definitely worth doing. OK, and um, we've also got a question from from Danny as well. He has comments. This isn't about me and my thoughts. What do we need to do to ally correctly? Uh, oh, there's so many things that men can do uh, to be good allies and we will really notice and appreciate it. So thank you for offering and, and please do it. Uh, so first of all, I think when a woman speaks up in a meeting, affirm what she says, because men are much more likely to affirm what other men say than to affirm what women say. Uh, and actually, by the way, women aren't all that good at affirming what women say either. And therefore, both genders, I think, need to affirm what women say at meetings okay. so that we don't have this thing of a woman making a point and no one taking any notice and then a man taking credit for exactly the same point 10 minutes later. If a woman gets talked over or interrupted, then you as an ally can say, oh, hang on a minute, I was really interested in what Vanessa was saying. Or indeed, if a man uh, repeats what Vanessa says later, you can say, oh, I'm so glad you agree with what Vanessa said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think become aware of your own unconscious bias, which I'm sure you're not doing deliberately, but is very common in both men and women. So 70% of men will evaluate a, a man more highly than a woman for achieving exactly the same goals. 70% of men. And that's because you tend to suffer from what's called affinity bias. You prefer people like you without necessarily realizing it. And so you will tend to mark a man more highly than a woman and often more likely to want to hire or promote a man than a woman just because he reminds you of you. You feel more comfortable with him. He feels like a better fit. And you have to get over that sort of bias. But I think calling out sexism when you see it happening, particularly to other, um, you know, when other, other men are doing it in, a, in an all male um, environment, you know, one man says something sexist. I think if you can call it out, that is really helpful because we're not there to do it. And I think, you know, it's a bit like racism 10 or 20 years ago when a group of white people might feel it was safe to make a casually racist joke, you know, with no people of color around. Now they wouldn't because they know that other white people would say, hang on a minute, you can't say that. And I think that we need to we need to make sexism as unacceptable as racism. And it's men who need to help us do that. It is. Uh, what you're saying is, is, is interesting because it's women need to do it as well, because we are also biased against women, aren't we? And you've got a whole chapter about yeah. this in the book. And I capture myself doing it and I, can, I put a post on LinkedIn, so I'm not calling you a sexist bigot, but <laughs> because I <laughs> yeah, because because I I do it, and obviously not when kind of you're looking at CVs because you're being aware then, and you're making sure that you aren't attaching any bias. But but I think just naturally in general everyday conversation, you know, maybe we don't have that affinity bias, but we still, as women, because we've been taught all our lives afford more authority to men. Hmm, that's right. Um, women do it too, because we've all been brought up in the same world in which men are basically still in charge. And therefore it's so much easier to associate male with authority than female with authority. And we've probably grown up in families in which our father earned more than our mother, maybe worked more than our mother, maybe had more authority at home than our mother. And so that's the bias, you know, that our, that our, um, 
uh, our sort of unconscious brains are still feeling. But we have to notice when it happens and then correct for it. So, you know, if we walk up to a man and a woman standing next to each other, don't necessarily address the man first, which one is always tempted to do. Uh, make sure you're listening as attentively to women as to men. And if you find yourself asking, you know, oh, I wonder if she knows what she's talking about. Stop. Listen to the content of what she's saying. Don't judge her by her gender or by the pitch of her voice. Because these yeah. things are very ingrained, but we can notice when they surface and try and do something about it. Yeah, there's such an opportunity too when people are getting in guest speakers and doing panel discussions and feature mm -hmm. talks, you know, within the business. I see so many times they'll get like, oh, here's our executive panel. And it's like all men. And it oh. doesn't mean that there's no females as executives in the company just for yeah. whatever reason whoever was thinking to make up this, oh, we're gonna make this good looking panel. Uh, and they just tend to pick, you know, maybe one female, but five males. And it's kind of like, if we can consciously try to get equal representation of qualified people in those situations, then that helps further the, the communication without making a big, you know, mm. we're equal statement, but just do it. Yeah, it really matters. If, if you only have one woman in a group of men in almost any environment, it's terribly bad for the woman. And it's yeah. really bad for our subliminal um, uh, sort of associations. You know, So, for instance, if you only have one woman on a short list, it is vanishingly unlikely that she will get the job hmm. because subliminally we are you know, we're absorbing this notion that if it's four men and a woman, that men are four times better at this sort of type of job than a woman is. Yeah. And if you only have one woman on a selection panel, ditto, you're very unlikely to select a woman because the men will think, oh, we don't have to worry about all this gender diversity business. We can leave it to her. And she thinks, oh, I better not recommend the female candidate because the men will think I'm being nepotistic. It's, yeah, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, aren't you? Um, there's, yeah, you just um, need more than one woman. So you should exactly. always have more than one on a short list, always have more than one on a selection panel and always have more than one on a, you know, panels conference. Yeah, and it becomes very difficult. I my, my husband, my wonderful husband, who's so good to me because he cooks and cleans. Well, aren't you lucky? Oh, not, <laughs> I'm so lucky. Back to that again. Um, he was saying the other day he had a, a shortlist. He was hiring for people, and the majority of people on his shortlist were female. And he said, "I wonder if I've gone the other way. Am I now not looking at men?" But actually, when we went through it, it was these were the best people for the job, and he's very conscious of choosing the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. And I know, Vanessa, you said oh, well, when you're looking at CVs, you're made to be more conscious of who you're looking at. But that, you know, with the work that I do as well, coaching people to be more self-aware, just because you know you should be doesn't mean you're overcoming the bias, mm -hmm. does it, Marianne? It's just, no. you know, just knowing it isn't enough. It's doing something about it. And this allyship is obviously a great idea. But for us as females to be allies to each other and not be in competition with each other, Mm. because we are um and that needs to stop right from the early days is let's support each other yeah um, yeah, and very we much, yeah. Allies. Uh, there was an interesting experiment done at the hubble space telescope mm -hmm. and you have to apply for time on it and of course everybody wants to use it all these scientists and men used to get quite a lot more time than women until they applied a blind cv and application process so that the adjudicators didn't know whether it was a man or a woman applying. And then women started getting more time than men. Huh. And, and they thought they were doing it on merit, but they weren't. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah. That's really um, cool. Roberts, Roberts said uh, companies do need to measure the gender pay gap. And he shared, a, um, he shared a website here that you can go to, which I'm assuming is to help people do that. Um, and we've also got LinkedIn user. Some of us are invisible for multiple reasons. Well, you are, because we haven't got your name, but ironically, <laughs> I'm here. It's not only being female, um, uh, there are others, a double, a triple whammy. Um, yeah, and I write quite a lot about that in the book, about the intersectionality of it. So, you know, if it's difficult enough simply being female, if you're a woman of colour, the authority gap's even wider. If you're working yeah. class, it's wider. If, if you've got disabilities, it's wider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you you, you lose, lose, lose. Um, mm. Five ladies, five lady ministers, in Egypt, uh, they're planning for immigration, culture, and environmental change. That's brilliant. Excellent. And um, Sophie Fisher, some CEOs refuse to join all male panels. 
Hi, Sophie. I know you. <laughs> yes, and good for you. I mean, I think all men ought to refuse to join all, all male panels. Some men do. I, I think more should. But yeah, then are we not allowed to have all female panels then? Is that, uh, should we all be more careful not to? Well, I mean, I'm genuinely in favour of equality. And I think feminism is about just equality between the sexes. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm as worried about the disproportionate number of young men killing themselves or, you know, young working class white boys doing badly at school as I am about uh, the female issues that I write mm -hmm. about. So generally, I, I prefer 50-50, just yeah. representing the population. Yeah. So uh, Anna is saying that um, she likes Robert's input, but doesn't see the government reinforcing it in any other way. I think the government are too busy partying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bring your own bottle. <laughs> uh, men should also refuse to join all male boards. Yeah, Absolutely. and maybe females should refuse to join all female boards. I mean, you know, we're not helping by by dividing and conquering, are we? I suppose. Mm. Um, Question for Marianne, two parts of this question. I recruit in the engineering sector. Why do you think it's very women short, but primary school is very men short? Because of these ridiculously old fashioned stereotypes that we still harbor in our brains, you know, that engineering is for men and that teaching is, or particularly teaching young children is, is for women. Um, but surely we've got beyond that now, haven't we? And uh, it's not that women, that girls are any less good than boys at maths, for instance, which you need for engineering, um, but many fewer girls than boys do A-level physics, which you also need for engineering. And that I think is entirely down to stereotypes and also the girls worrying what the boys will think of them, mm -hmm. you know, if they're doing physics A-level, because in girls' schools, they're two and a half times more likely to do physics A-level than in co-ed schools which suggests it's very much a question of social conditioning, not of ability. Interesting. Really interesting. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> Something that you said, because um, we having that kind of equality of numbers, and I remember in the book, um, you were saying that in, in kind of at C-suite level, quite often uh, one woman will join the C-suite at some point, and then... The, the kind of the board will think, oh, that's it, job done. Yeah. And it's quite common to just have one woman up at the top, but yeah. no more. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that, perhaps? And, and yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, in companies where the CEO is female, they're twice as likely to have another female, either a CFO or COO. And so, you know, you talked a little bit, um, Sarah, about women not helping other women. But what this suggests, actually, is that women do help other women once they get to the top more than men do. Good. And again, it's very uncomfortable to be the only woman in a, in a, um, you know, a C-suite or whatever it is full of men. So I think those male dominated organisations ought to try and recruit a few more. And I think there's there's a challenge in that, you know, Obviously, as you may have seen with uh, the comments on Vanessa's post and others, there was a bit of uncomfortable males, um, you know, being a little bit defensive and being quite kind. Um, but basically, how do you have any strategies for getting over the challenge that people who don't realize they've had privilege in their life? When, when equality comes along, they feel that they're being persecuted, that they're being, you know, they're losing, but mm. they just don't realize that they've had such an advantage because all these guys tend to be the kind of people who say, well, I don't see a problem. It's fine for me. Uh, when <laughs> yeah. in fact, that's exactly the point. Um, mm. But how do you get beyond that sort of thinking and to get people to realize that privilege that they've had? Well, what I say is, it's, it's as if men are swimming in a river with quite a strong current. And of course, they can't feel the current, but they can see the banks racing past them and they think, wow, I'm a strong swimmer. And then they see women swimming in the opposite direction, struggling to make headway against this current. And they think, well, they're clearly just not as good at swimming as I am. <laughs> uh, so I use that as an analogy. So what I would say to the men is, A, read the book, because there is so much evidence there proving that this bias still exists and that you've got a current going in your direction and mm -hmm. women are swimming against it. But B, actually, one of the most cheering things I discovered in doing the research was that more equality is not a zero-sum game. It's actually a positive-sum game 
from which men gain as well. And you would think it was like a seesaw, you know, women rise, men fall. But it's not like that at all. So there's a huge amount of academic research that shows that both in more gender equal societies and in more gender equal relationships, going back to the beginning of this conversation in which the men and women mm -hmm. in a straight relationship at least share the chores and the childcare pretty equally, not only are the women happier and healthier, which you might expect, mm -hmm. and children are happier and healthier and they do better at school and they have fewer behavioral difficulties and the girls are more ambitious and the boys are less likely to be violent, but the men themselves are happier and healthier. And so they're twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives, half as likely to be depressed. They tend to drink less, smoke less, take fewer drugs, get more sleep at night. And here is the absolute clincher for any of you guys watching. They get more frequent and better sex. They're the lucky ones, not yes. us. Yes. <laughs> There you go. If that isn't um, great for equality, I don't know what is. But... Um, yes, so, yes gender equality is a concern for men. This yeah, is why. yeah it, it is. And um, Lisa, um, Lisa is a data queen. So she works a lot. I know Lisa well. She works a lot in male environments. Uh, her question is, the challenge is also why would any woman join, uh, in, join an all-male company when we know it's going to be so hard? But then how do we affect change? Well, yes, I mean, it's certainly true that more than 60 percent of women will say that before joining an organization, they will look at the upper ranks and see how equal it is. And they're much more likely to join an, an employer who they think has reasonable equality already. And so it's a bit chicken and egg. I mean, what that means is that if you are more equal as a company, you've got a far bigger talent pool to choose from yeah. because more women are going to want to join you. So it is very much in your interest in terms of the sort of quality of the people you're going to be able to recruit. Um, if you're talking all male. Of quality, talking of quality, um, where, where you've been told by a recruiter that they need a bird for the role, I would suggest that this is not a quality employer or a quality recruiter. No, that's, that's terrible. That's terrible. Absolutely disgraceful. Um, Sophie, men who attend conferences and questions can also pre preface questions with a comment about an all-male panel. Just call it out. Yeah. Do you know, I once was at a conference uh, and there were two all-male panels in a row and it happened to be on International Women's Day. So I just <laughs> tweeted, um, goodness, uh, two all-male panels in a row on International Women's Day. Um, surely, and it, one of them was economists. I said, surely they could have got a female economist. There are lots of great women economists out there. And a man who I didn't know replied, if that Seacart woman were my wife, I would abuse her. <gasps> yeah. Wow. And all I had done was draw attention to the fact that there were no women on a panel. He wanted to beat me up. Well, he oh, went into an immediate threat response, didn't he? Yeah. Which says, and when we, that happens, it shows we've got something to hide. Yeah. Wow. is a foul place for women, isn't it? Um, Danny has made a long comment, but we're going to stick with it. I might have to read it off the whole screen, though. Let's try it again. OK, there are biases that indicate that some traits are feminine and some are masculine. For example, caring, nurturing, etc., are judged as feminine. As these are views as inherent, not learned skills that women have, their value is also, I just need to come off that, their value is also, God, where's it gone? Perceived as less result, uh, as less, resulting in very low paid roles for female carers, teachers, etc. It's these biases that need addressing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the problem is that because of these biases, life is made much harder for us women at work. Because we have this bias that tells us that women ought to be nurturing and gentle and kind and caring and compassionate and unselfish and unthreatening and uncompetitive. When a woman starts to behave as confidently and as assertively as her male colleagues, which you have to do in order to be taken as seriously as them, we quite often recoil and we find her dislikable and we start using words about her like, abrasive or strident mm. or aggressive yeah, or yeah. bossy, overbearing, bitchy, ball breaking, scary, all these adjectives that are never used about men showing exactly the same character traits. And we've just got to get out of this. I mean, it is so old fashioned. And, you know, one of the things I say in the book is if you start using these sorts of adjectives about a woman or finding her unlikable because she is confident, 
examine your own prejudice because mm-hmm. the chances are the problem lies in you and in your unconscious bias, not in her. Absolutely. Completely. There's some great there's some great comments coming. Robert's got to go, but delighted to see you and, and get this issue ra- uh, raised. Um, I'll be publishing my reading of the book on a LinkedIn post soon. Thanks for the business venture for a great session. It's a pleasure. Do come back and see us next week, Robert. We've been delighted to have you. Um, Lisa has uh, had feedback on an uns- unsuccessful role that was very similar. The irony is that the successful candidate was absolutely the right choice, and I didn't need to be told that a different type of face was needed in the team. Uh, oh, sorry, that's Danny to Lisa. Danny, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was that the wrong way around because then I saw Lisa would come up again. Lisa's off now. Let's have a cheer for, for Lego removing gender from its set. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Which Good is day. another reason, actually, why more boys do engineering because they get given more sort of spatial mm-hmm. toys to play with when they're little. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, LinkedIn user, I declined to join a huge international consumer goods firm because of their all male board. Despite being offered a much higher salary, there were other reasons of, but that was a factor in their ability to be modern and dynamic or not. There's so many clues that you can get, aren't there, yes. at an interview that are warning signs that go, don't go there. Mm. Don't go there. It's when mm. we choose to ignore them and then end up in them and then get annoyed by them. And you think, well, the warning sign was about five months ago. <laughs> yeah. I think if, if you join at the top in a very senior role, it's, you know, you're in a better position to, yeah. to change the organization and have a positive influence in in inviting more diversity but it's very difficult to change an organization if you're not at the very top you know but, yeah. but if you are going to accept a role and you are going to be only female in there i think you you would question maybe if you're younger do i want this fight because you know it's going to be a fight and i think maybe when you get to kind of our age kind of 20 30 years into our careers we think you know what i can go somewhere easier and do something that would be more joyous because i've had i've had 20 or 30 years of battling (laughs) i'm quite good at that and i've I've kind of yeah don't need that anymore (laughs) but we do need some women at the top battling so that these organizations become more equal and then can recruit more junior women. I mean, someone's got to be the guinea pig, sadly. And I, you know, I'm full yeah. of admiration for yeah, yeah. battle through. Yeah, and 21 year old me was the, the first female ever hired in, in a department and um, yeah. w- was told, like, in the second interview, that the only reason I'm hiring you is because HR said I had to. Oh. Um, so, but I went in to prove them wrong, and they ended up hiring a lot more women after me because they realized that, hey, both genders can do this job, even though it's a bit technically oriented. Great. So, I think I was lucky in that I was able to help affect change. And even though the manager at the time had his head firmly in you know the past the rest of the team were really strong and supportive and that's what made the difference that's yeah. what made it not a bad situation because all the other guys were saying oh hey you're really getting this you're learning it you know you're doing well but and telling the boss that so i think it can work if you have that ground grassroots support even if you're more junior it yeah. is going to be a hard job though and you do have to be ready to accept that you're going to get some of those the crap comments from the, the people who are still in the past. Um, I think we Rachel, have Rachel, sorry, 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 can I just can I just finish because Rachel's comment was too big to go on the screen. But, but what she's saying is, you know, we we have this bias at home with our children, and and, and we do it without even thinking. You know, don't be a girl's blouse, don't cry like a girl, and and all this sort of stuff. Um, and she said, needless to say, I don't stand for this at all. I'm actively encouraging equality in our home in the hope that I'm helping our sons to actively support women's voices. Good for you. Good. Yeah, we can all make a difference at every stage, can't we? Yeah, and it starts so young. It's really depressing how early it starts, oh. this sense of sort of male superiority that both boys and girls absorb from the age of about six. It's mm-hmm. tragic. Yeah. Well, from the day we're born, we're getting we're getting the information into our brains telling us what is true, and we believe it. Um, but it isn't know. true. You know, girls actually outperform boys at every single academic level, right up to PhDs. Completely. So I worked with the University Women's Club, founded by a group of trailblazing women in 1896. Woo! The UWC is still the only all-female club to be owned and managed by its members, and we would be delighted to invite Mary Ann to speak to our members who value... 
what do they value? Let me just the supportive on. network that the club affords. There we go. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Get, get in touch. <laughs> get in touch. I'm sure Mary Ann will be delighted. Um, I know we're running out of time, Vanessa, so I will hand back over to you. Uh, yeah, what was I going to ask for the last, or, or maybe last question? So maybe let's just um, reaffirm again what we can do. I think I think as women, we need to help more women up. And there was, um, I think I think it's the vi visibility and authority, isn't it? And and the Financial Times looked back at, at just again quoting from your book at where it had used experts for quotes. And when they look back on their past issues, I think 16%, only 16% were from women. And so they've made changes now to make things more equal so that women are as visible as, as men. So what else What else has happened maybe since well, that you're, you're aware of recently or since your book has been published to kind of inspire us to make change going forward, Marianne? No, I mean, it's, too, it's been published too recently, really. Um, but I do make 140 suggestions of solutions in the back in the last chapter of the book I counted wow. the other day. I mean, there are so many things that we can do. And they're all quite small things because each instance of authority gap type behavior is, I mean, it's irritating when it happens, when someone talks over you in a meeting or doesn't listen to your ideas or whatever. But it's not career ending but they accumulate, like they roll up like compound interest over the course of a working life to create this huge gap between women and men. And so I think the solutions are all quite small, but I think rolled up together could make an enormous difference. So I've got suggestions for what we can do as, as individuals, as partners, as parents, as colleagues, as employers, what teachers can do, what the media can do, what governments can do. There's a huge amount there. But I would say the fun, two fundamental things, a, accept that however intelligent or liberal or even female you are, you probably harbour unconscious bias against women. I do, and I've written a whole book yeah. about it. <laughs> um, and secondly, don't mistake confidence for competence, because they're absolutely not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we are socially conditioned to be females, um, to be less overtly confident than men are. And as I said earlier, people don't like it if we are as confident mm -hmm. as they are. So it's not just a question of leaning in or sending us on assertiveness training courses, you know. But as a result, if we take men at their word, we will assume that they are more competent than women, and they're not. Because men are much more likely to self-promote. They're, mu they're much more, they're allowed to self-promote in a way that women aren't, because we don't like it if women do it. And so we're much more likely to hire or promote the super confident, but not necessarily very competent man over the more modest, but super competent woman. And that's oh, what we've got to change. Yeah, Absolutely. no, that's so true. And it is that swimming with, with the flow, isn't it, of the river. And if, if we, as interviewers, as leaders, can recognise that women have had a much harder time to get there... Mm. Um, and, and yeah, and, and as you say, don't confuse confidence with competence. And for somebody who isn't maybe as confident as the other person, just yeah, lean into that and, and, and be aware of that. It's a really good point. And don't hold it against them because we make it so much harder for women to be the right level of confident. You know, not yeah. confident enough and you're disrespected, confident enough and you're disliked. Yeah. So, you know, just accept that it's much harder for women. And if you ask a, you know, a seemingly innocuous question in a job interview, like, tell me something you're most proud of, you know, your greatest achievement, that is toxic for women. So they will think, oh, God, I'm not allowed to boast. I've been brought up not to boast. So they'll say something safe like, oh, my two wonderful children. You know, doesn't help them at all in the interview. Whereas a man will say, well, in my previous job, I doubled sales and I quadrupled profit margins. And you'll think, ah, he's the one we want to hire. <laughs> you have a fan. I think you have more than one. You've got three on screen with you and plenty of you. Um, and plenty you've read your book. But uh, Malcolm Nicholas, he's a fan. Um, and uh, Alex says, thank you. I mean, what, what, a, what a fantastic topic and so much more to talk about. But we're running out of time. We are running out of time. Um, so, yeah, um, oh, there's some more. Uh, oh, Caroline's just joined. Caroline's <laughs> in. Uh, is a consequence of the authority a confidence gap for women? Um, yes, 
But as I say, it's not something that you can just narrow by being more confident, because if you do that, you're quite often punished for it. So the only way through uh, is to overlay a huge amount of warmth onto your manner and your personality in order to mitigate the hostility that arises as a result of you being as confident as the men. And so, you know, you tend to smile more. I can, here I am, you know, I've been watching myself on Zoom for the past <laughs> two years and I realize that I smile when I talk and I'm sure that's an unconscious way of trying to overlay this sort of warmth so that people don't recall and think, oh, she's abrasive or strident. We smile more, we use humor more, we have to be much more emotionally intelligent, read the room, not, you know, dent any male egos. And that's a huge burden. It's very exhausting. Yeah. It's something that men don't have to bear at all. Um, but I think that's probably the only way through. I wish I didn't have to recommend it. And I hope it's only a sort of transitional phase and that yeah. as we get many more women in authority, we, we will stop having these double standards. But for now, I'm afraid that's what women do still have to do. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> it, it is, it's uncomfortable to admit that whilst we are in this transitional phase until we have more authority and more visibility, we are going to have to check ourselves so that we're not too abrasive or ball breaky or whatever it might be mm. so that we don't kind of set people oh god that's a hate <laughs> <saying it. laughs> but we have we're kind of we've, we've come to the end so um on behalf of everybody who is watching and thank you to everyone who has joined us and put yeah. questions in today uh, and on behalf of, of my panel thank you so much for joining us on the yeah. thank and you yeah, so thank much you. If you've not read it, people at home, it, it's it's an eye-opening, shockingly surprising book. And I know a few people, like I say, on, on my post said, I don't agree. And was, well, the research is there. You can't not agree with it because it's fact that yeah. it's there. But um, we're back next week. And I think Sarah is going to... Um, what are you going to do with us next week, Sarah? I'm going to be talking next week about the five human psychological needs that all leaders Ooh. need to be aware of, um, which actually covers part of this as well, because it's all about bias and how we treat people fairly. So, uh, yeah, if you are a leader thinking of leading or being led by anybody and feeling slightly disgruntled, come along and listen to that because you'll understand why and what you can do about it. Fabulous. Right. So Looking thank, forward you. To it. thank you again, Mary Ann. It's been wonderful to have you with us. Oh well, thank you. It's thank been you great. Much. It's been a blast. Thank Thanks you. And thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.